Hello, everybody. Welcome to what I think is the, yes, the inaugural episode. Oh, I plugged that sentence. That's a great start. <laughs> Let me try that again. No, we're keeping that. Oh. <laughs> Let me try it again. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Mythologic Podcast, or Mythological. My co-host came up with the name. I'm still not quite sure what it's supposed to be. Well, it is highly illogical. Yeah, exactly. So we'll go with Mythological. Let's say it that way. Uh, so, hello everybody, welcome to what is hopefully going to be an hour, maybe an hour and a half, of pure, unrestrained mythology. I'm, of course, joined today by the newly anointed Dr. Andrew Croft's PhD. <laughs> well, close, but not quite. <laughs> yeah, nearly there. Good As as good as, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, who is going to be my expert witness uh, to everything I get wrong today. Yeah, I think we should probably preface this by saying, so this is going to be a podcast that's going to be examining mythology of all kind of shapes and sizes. I think we should start by getting our excuses in early and saying that uh, neither of us are really experts in this field. We're both just two amateurs who have a fascination with different world mythologies, and we wanted to have a go and just go through it and kind of learn with you guys and just talk about what we have been learning over the last week. And in my case, I realised just how much I'd forgotten from what I'd previously learned. Yes, exactly. One thing I would like to say before we begin is we originally intended to record this in person. We wanted to actually sit around a table and be able to do this face-to-face and have a bit better of a flow. But uh, due to the prevailing circumstances uh, in the UK right now, no one is allowed to travel for anything other than essential work. We've tried, we've tried our best. We're going to record this as you can tell, over Discord, and hopefully it'll turn out well. What we're really hoping to do in the future is to come back and try and do this in person. So look forward to that in future episodes when we get round to it. And if anyone can think of a way to justify this as essential work to the police when I drive up there, then, you know, let us know. I think we even, like, the night the lockdown came in, I said to you, like, should I bring you down one of my good microphones that I bought for this and is just sat on my table downstairs and can't be used now? Should I just like bring it down? But then we were like, no, I wouldn't get there and get back in time before the lockdown comes into place. Yeah, and we both had actual work to do as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you were like at the final point of handing in your PhD, weren't you? Was it actually the night before? It might have been the night before. So yeah, we were cutting it pretty <laughs> fine. Let's put it that way. So, yeah, anarchy in the UK. Very quiet anarchy, at least. Yeah. But hopefully this will be a little bit more organised. So, Crofty, do you want to tell us the topic that you chose for us today as the original conceiver and creator of this podcast? Yes. Uh, for today's podcast, to say, here be dragons. Here be dragons. I, I don't think I've ever actually said that to me, but I have already written episode one, here be dragons, as the folder <laughs> name for this. Well, fools seldom differ. Yes. Yes. Uh, so today we're going to be looking through the world of dragons. We're going to look at their earliest origins, and then we're going to kind of do, do a bit of a globe-trotting expedition uh, and look at how different cultures have interpreted the idea of dragons and other monstrous serpents. We are kind of kicking things off on a very oriental theme. So Crofty, we kind of split this up, didn't we? So that I started off with kind of the early origins of dragons I'm not going to say in the West, I'll say kind of in the Middle East, um, because that's kind of the closest to an origin point that most of Western uh, mythology surrounding dragons has. You, on the other hand, took the Far East. You took China and you took Japan. Yes. Then we also had that a few cultures where a lot of people wouldn't expect to find dragons as well. Yeah, I mean... I made a point of, before we started this, of going away and actually reading up on some of the theories as to where dragons originate from. I also found one of those theories, and you might actually steal my thunder when I get to reading it out later on, if we found the same one. Yeah, we'll see We'll see how closely we differ. But um, we kind of messed things up a little bit, kind of wildcard style. So you're also looking at the origins of dragon-like entities, entities in Africa, uh, which is going to include places like Egypt, so there's going to be a bit of crossover between us there, I imagine. Mm, and also some crossover, I believe, in dragons I found in Western Africa, as I believe they had crossover with Haiti because of migration and such. That's interesting. Yeah, and then on top of that, 
I think you've also taken kind of Oceania in that region, and I have taken North uh, and South America. Yeah, so fairly even split, I'd say. Yeah, pretty even. I mean, I think what kind of balances the scales for me is just how much mythology there is based around dragons in Western Europe. That kind of helps me out. I've got loads of stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did kind of become very, very widespread in the past few thousand years. I remember like when I was beginning the very, very initial stages of research for this, and I went to the page on dragons on Wikipedia because that's where everyone starts with this sort of thing. And I think there was literally a quote from some guy in the 19th century saying, already too much has been written about dragons. <laughs> I was like, oh, you poor, sum- like, my poor summer child. Like, <laughs> if you had only seen what, what was yet to come. Tolkien hadn't been born. Yeah. So I was going to ask before we start, actually, was, do you remember what your first exposure to dragons was? Like, as a, as a mythical creature, what was the subject, and what was the context where you came across them first? Because I think we might have the same answer. Uh... I think mine was the dragon guarding the golden fleece. Ah, okay. No, that's very different then. That's that was. I was half expecting you to say that your first exposure to dragons was Smaug the Magnificent from The Hobbit. <laughs> it wasn't until I was about twelve or thirteen that I read The Hobbit. I know a late starter there. Whereas Greek mythology was from when I was about seven. Yeah, you see, they didn't teach that in the ramshackal schools of Yorkshire that I went to. So I was relying on the dog-eared copy of The Hobbit that I was given as a seven-year-old um, to get any initial introduction to it. And that's kind of like the archetypical dragon as a result in my mind. The the image of the like first, well, not the first edition, but the later editions of The Hobbit with Smaug spread out across the Golden Horde almost a a synthesis of both Eastern and Western ideas as to what the dragon is supposed to be uh, in in terms of just how serpentine he was. But also much more malevolent than a lot of of Eastern dragons. Mm. That's also another interesting split we're going to see, I imagine, is there is a, a very obvious role for dragons throughout much of Western mythology, and not a particularly nice one either. Hmm. Right, as we're going to get started, let's talk about our origin stories, potentially, for dragons then. I don't know about you, I went straight to looking for theories as to where the kind of concept of dragons may have originated within the human psyche, and the immediate theory I hit upon was the association uh, with dangerous predators from kind of evolutionary past of humanity. Hmm, I came across something quite similar. Yeah, so a lot of... Uh, theories tend to point as far as i can tell towards human ancestral fears of things like venomous snakes uh nile crocodiles and other dangerous creatures of that regard i I think what's particularly interesting to me in light of these theories is i was kind of looking at the historical range of the nile crocodile and it's interesting that in the west at least and as i'll get into a little bit when we come to kind of mesoamerica the range of the Nile crocodile was a lot larger, and it quite closely corresponds to some of the air, like the earliest areas to have stories associated with either giant serpents or dragon-like creatures. Hmm. Which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you say the Nile crocodile because I have a quote here from a French explorer, Andre Thevet. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I can't speak French. This this entire episode, by the way, guys, is just going to be a minefield of mispronunciations <laughs> of proper names, uh, of just terminology. We're just going to get everything wrong, so let's lay that on the table. Yeah, wait until we get to the Maori. Oh, That's God. going to be a fun one. <laughs> but yeah, it's bad enough with French, apparently. Um, French explorer André Thévet, he um, was in Africa, and he described the creatures in Africa included, and I quote here, an enormous quantity of savage animals, lions, tigers, dragons, leopards, buffaloes, hyenas, panthers, and others. No mention of anything like a crocodile like you would expect if he'd explored close to the Nile, hmm. but mention of dragons. Oh, interesting. This, this, is obvi- this is obviously much more recent than the actual origins of dragons, but the fact that, you know, I think it was 17th century, French explorer, referring yes. to what we assume would be a large crocodile as a dragon does lend a bit of support to the idea that 
the myths came from um came from these kinds of reptiles a lot longer in the past yeah i mean that's kind of interesting because uh, as i'll go into there are literally accounts of crocodiles extant from like the 8th century bc so it's it's kind of interesting that as late as that people are still referring to those animals as dragons yeah moving on kind of from that theory i came across two other notable theories that i think are thought to have contributed either to the image of dragons or to the image of sea serpents which in most early mythology up until like the middle ages is pretty much the classic design of the dragon what we commonly associate with the dragon image that is a much later invention and we'll get into that when it's appropriate the other two things i kind of found as to their origin the first one was misinterpretation by humans of fossil the fossil record um, yeah i I'd, I'd found a few similar things i think that was dismissed quite quickly right from what i understood oh sorry i just interrupted you there no no with a, no, with a, no that's wrong how dare you <laughs> yeah but, um yeah no, no I, what i was going to say is that that's kind of considered a bit of a dubious theory I mean, one argument I saw on that side which seemed somewhat convincing was that um, some of it may have been not really like misinterpretations of, well, dinosaurs or anything like that, but misinterpretation of like bones of large sea, like sea dwelling mammals in areas that had since dried up. Ah. So that was an argument yeah. for where the kind of sea serpent idea came from or the dragon, because these people would have had no way of knowing that this area had previously been underwater, for example. Yeah. Yeah, that that to me seemed more plausible. Yeah, I would have basically dismissed the idea of it being, say, a, a dinosaur fossil that had been found out of hand just because if it had been the ancient Greeks who'd found it, they would have immediately put it in a temple and said, this is one of the heads of Typhon that Zeus killed. Yeah, exactly. And there, yeah. there would be a record of that being stored somewhere where it, and displayed, presumably, at the temples. Whereas a sea serpent, they were seen as more more in the mortal realm than, say, Typhon. I mean, I, that was the last thing I wanted to get into kind of on those theories was another theory I saw was that, you know, stories around the kind of prototypical sea serpents, one influence potentially could be on that. There's kind of missightings of creatures like whales uh, at sea, because if you're only seeing a whale from above as it's breaching, it could seem like a very different creature, potentially. Yeah. And in kind of an extension to that, there's also a species of fish known as the oarfish. This is a creature which grows to be about eight meters long, and it just looks exactly like a sea serpent, basically. Hmm. I don't know if you've seen these before. I don't think I have, no. Let me pull up a quick image for you here of it. Yeah, I think um, there's a famous image of the old fish like being posed by some naval, like um, uh, what's the word, naval cadets who'd found it washed up, and they kind of have a habit of lingering near the surface of the water when they're uh, like close to death, which which would kind of make sense in the context of a sea uh, sea serpent. Hmm. Yeah, so this is the old fish, and it's not displaying it. Great. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's not just my end then. <laughs> Technology failure. Okay, never mind. Um, but yes, yeah, so take my word for it, Crofty. The oarfish is a probably a significant uh, influence when it comes to sea serpent sightings in the past. I mean, a lot of kind of sketches that we get from the era, kind of early antiquarian studies, they're like, oh yeah, this is a grounded sea serpent. It's like that's, that's an oarfish, mate. We can we can tell. And when, when the video goes up and the image is actually there, I'll post my response to seeing the image in the comments. Yeah, exactly. Rather than actually, rather than actually reacting to it now. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> just uh, pre-record your response and I'll eventually put it on another video like five or six episodes from now. <laughs> so that's kind of everything I had in terms of origins. Unless you have anything to add, Crofty, I think we should move into our kind of uh, earliest examples within the mythological record. Can I save my origin story for the end? Because it it does fit in with some of the stuff I'm going to talk about later, and it is very much different from what you've just gone into. I mean, it's your podcast. You can do what you want. <laughs> okay, I'm going to save it to the end. <laughs> no arguments. I think it's probably best if I lead with my earliest example, simply because it relates to kind of the earliest civilization that we have any sort of record for, and that is the Sumerians. So for people unfamiliar with Sumeria... Sumeria was 
a region in southern Iraq around the Arabian Gulf. And it's really the, the place where we see the first ama- emergence of major cities within the archaeological record in the fourth millennium BC. It's in this culture that we see the earliest description of creatures that, to my mind, resemble dragons. They're not directly uh, identified as such, which makes things a little difficult, but they include many of the later iconography associated with dragons. So, in our first example of a complete disaster of a pronunciation, the first example that I can find within Mesopotamian history of a creature that resembles a dragon is a creature known as the Mushkushu. This is the creature that you should be seeing at the moment, and it should be up for viewers as well, a scaly four-legged beast with the head of a horned snake. Uh, It also has the forelimbs of a lion and the talons of an eagle. So this is quite an obviously draconic creature. What's interesting to me is that this is a very, very early example of a creature that's got dragon-like attributes that's presented as being winged. Hmm. Because we have to wait quite late after this for other depictions of winged dragons to start appearing. And uh, kind of up until, as I say, the Middle Ages, it's very variable. I was going to say, in fact, a lot of cultures, dragons nev- never had wings. Yeah. Outside of Europe, there were quite, most, quite a lot of cultures where they just flew by magic, essentially. So the earliest association of this creature is known from the right at the end of the 3rd millennium BC. And it appears on a ruler of the, I think it's the city of Lagash. I'm trying to remember. Um, And it appears on the seal of the local king, or Ensi, by the name of Gudea. And it's associated with a god called, I'm going to mess this one up as well, Ningish Zida. So this was the Sumerian god of vegetation and the underworld. And he's frequently depicted on uh, clay seals from this era as a god with serpents sprouting from his body. So in the image I provided for you here, Crofty, you can see uh, like sprouting from his shoulders the similar creature. Yes, yeah. So he was yeah. god of vegetation and the underworld. Yeah, it's a kind of a strange... The, the Sumerian world and the Sumerian mythology is a very unusual place. There's a lot of crossover in roles. There's a lot of subsets of gods doing tasks underneath a higher god. And what really throws everything off is that over the course of a couple of millennia, they kind of add generations of gods and then they rename them based on different cultures which entered Mesopotamia. Yeah, I just wanted to get that in early because some of the stuff I'm going to be covering shortly is going to be... Yeah, it's going to be a little complicated and it can be a little difficult to follow. But this god is the first example of being served by this creature known as the Mushkushu. And it's basically a faithful servant. Um, it kind of appears in the role, again, of the defeated servant who uh, is, is like slain by the god and then becomes his, his servant afterwards. So this is the early attest- uh, earliest attestation of this particular creature. But it's more prominently known for its association with a later god. So this god is part of the Babylonian pantheon, which is related to the Sumerian pantheon, but slightly different. In the Babylonian pantheon, the chief god is a figure known as Marduk. So Marduk is like a third or fourth generational god who kind of takes on the roles of several prior gods throughout Mesopotamian history. So the previous kind of chief god before him was a figure known as Enlil, uh, and before him it was An, who was the sky. And over time, he slowly kind of accumulated their roles, and he accumulated iconography from other gods as well. And the Mushkushu is very much in that vein. It is, again, a creature in the same as with its previous master that was defeated by Marduk and later became his servant. And that's that's kind of really it. There's not a great deal more to this creature than that. It could be an influencing factor on future draconic uh, iconography, but its role is likely quite limited. Hmm. Its most uh, its most famous attestation, actually, Crofty, I'll show you here, if I can get my computer to show the right thing. There we go. It's actually found on what's called the Ishtar Gate, and this is the Gate of Babylon, 
constructed by Nebuchadnezzar II. And this is probably the most prominent image of it that you're going to see anywhere. But yeah, that's that's kind of all there is really to this creature. That looks quite a recent image. Yes, so this is the restored image. The thing to remember is that Marduk is much later in the Pantheon than the previous skull I mentioned, Ningid Cedar. He's kind of, this is kind of around sixth century BC. This is like a millennium and a half removed. Yeah. And I mean more in terms of it looks very well restored. Yeah, this is the actual outer um, facade of the of the gate that's been taken and reconstructed in a museum. Ah. Because Babylon was kind of renovated, unfortunately, by Saddam Hussein. So a lot of the significant finds are now in museums um, as a result. But yeah, so that's kind of the first creature I found within the Mesopotamian context that seems almost like a proto-dragon. It has some of the attributes. It contends with a heroic figure. But it's not quite there, I would say. The second figure in Mesopotamian mythology that rep- resembles a dragon is one which I think I've mentioned to you before, and that will be familiar to anyone out there who's played a Final Fantasy game in their life. This is the creature known as Tiamat. So Tiamat occupies an unusual place within Mesopotamian mythology. So she actually appears far, far earlier than the more famous attestation of her. She appears kind of back in the third millennium BC. And at this point, she isn't a dragon-like entity at all. She is the entity known as Namu. So Namu is a quite obscure goddess within the Sumerian pantheon. She is a creator goddess, but by the time that she appears in the first written records, a lot of her roles seem to have kind of been delegated off to other gods most specifically, it's been delegated off to her son Enki, who is a very significant deity within Mesopotamian history. This isn't the recognisable figure of later Mesopotamian myth that's frequently cited as probably the earliest quote-unquote dragon. If we jump ahead again to the Babylonian pantheon that I mentioned beforehand, by that time, Namu has become an entity known as Tiamat, So Tiamat is presented in her role in a very, very different fashion. She is sort of a primeval creator goddess, but she's more of like a force of nature. She really represents the primordial salt sea and how it really mingled with the freshwater sea of the entity known as the Apsu. And this is, between these two, it's really where the rest of the gods sprang from. So from this, she basically begats the next few generations of gods. And the increasing activity and proliferation of these gods proves really stressful and worrying to her mate Absu, who, depending on the version of the tale, he basically sets out to destroy his offspring because he's basically he's concerned that they will usurp power from him. However, he is basically defeated in this role. The other gods get wind of this and his grandson Ea, who is the Babylonian version of Enki that I men- I mentioned beforehand, imprisons him and later slays him. Now, this drives Tiamat into a rage, because, you know, it's a slain husband, essentially. So she does battle the rest of the gods. In order to aid herself, she births 11 monstrous creatures, which includes ma- all manner of serpents and dragons, and an entity known as Kingu. And she essentially sets up Kingu as king of the gods. She gives him something that's called the Tablet of Destinies. Within Mesopotamian religion, the Tablet of Destinies is the item that belongs to the chief god. It is a cuneiform clay tablet with seal impressions on it, because basically the Mesopotamians saw their gods in very similar circumstances to themselves. You know, the the king in Mesopotamian society would seal his documents. And we actually see in one of these, let me find it, we actually see in one of these seals, one of the earliest representations of Tiamat potentially doing battle with with Marduk. In order to convince Marduk to go into conflict with Tiamat, the other gods basically agree with him that if he defeats Tiamat, he will be made king of the gods. Marduk at this point is very much presented in kind of this archetypical role role as a storm god, the god of winds and the god of thunder. 
And as described, he goes forth and he contends with Tiamat. It's very much ex- described, in, as in many of these mythologies, as a long, torturous battle. What Marduk eventually does is he summons the four winds and he uses it to trap Tiamat in place. Tiamat responds by trying to swallow him, but Marduk summons what's known as an evil wind, which he uses and basically blows into Tiamat's mouth and distends her horribly. With her neutralised, he then shoots an arrow through the heart and slays her. And this is uh, really the kind of Babylonian creation myth, because what Marduk then does is he takes her body and he uses it to fashion the sky and the earth. Um, This myth is known as the Enuma Elis. There are several different versions of it, but the version I gave is kind of the generic form of it. So, having defeated Tiamat, uh, Marduk takes the... the, I can't remember if he actually slays Kingu or not, that Tiamat set up as kind of her version of the King of the Gods, but he takes the Tablet of Destinies and he reigns from there on as King of the Gods. So the last thing I kind of have to say about this story is there's a little bit of controversy as to whether Tiamat it would have been considered by the Babylonians to actually be a dragon or not. So her description in the Enuma Elish is not really that of a dragon. Her physical description states that she is a creature with a tail, wide thighs and lower parts which shake, a belly, an udder, ribs, a neck, a head, a skull, eyes, nostrils, a mouth, and lips. And it also goes on, goes on to describe her entrails, which are just, you know, heart, arteries, and blood. What kind of makes people consider her in the mould of a later kind of draconic figure is that she's quite commonly represented on these seals, as you see, as a great serpent of forms. And some versions of the myth do describe her as a serpent. But yeah, the only thing I have left really from Mesopotamia to talk about is this is a story about... Oh, I'm going into the Fresh Prince theme song here, aren't I? <laughs> um, this is a story that people frequently point to. They specifically point to a particular image and say, oh, look, it's a dragon being fought by a Mesopotamian god. This is the image of Ninurta and the Anzu. So the depiction of the Anzu in these reliefs, which were found, I think they were found at the Assyrian capital of Assur. They might have been found at Nineveh which is the holiest city of Mesopotamia. So looking at this creature, Crofty, I think you very clearly get the impression that this is this is essentially a proto-dragon. Hmm. Yeah, there's it's, also similarity to the griffin, from what I can say as well. Yeah. Here it's portrayed in a fashion that looks slightly like a dragon, but what this actually seems to be trying to portray is actually a monstrous bird, because the Anzu is described as a bird in almost all versions of this mythology. But the Anzu, it's a, it's a slightly different type of story. It's a contention with the god Ninurta, who is the son of Enlil. And he is very much your kind of prototypical warrior god that we're going to get on into in a minute. Basically, what happens is that Anzu steals the Tablet of Destinies from his father, who is king of the gods. And Ninurta is tasked with crack- tracking down the creature and retrieving the tablet, which... He eventually gives back to his father. There is a whole wider body of mythology around that, but this is not... I would not say that this is like a direct dragonic iconography. I just thought it was worth bringing up because this is frequently labelled as such. If you find the average Wikipedia article, this is probably what you're going to see. This will probably say Marduk and Tiamat when it's not. That's not actually what it's depicting. Hmm. But yes, that's, that's kind of the range that we're getting of Mesopotamian draconic figures. Yeah, the, the fine in terms of what their powers are and such, they sound like quite similar to the early Greek gods, like the, the Tiamat, this early version of Tiamat sounds quite like Gaia, with her husband rep being quite similar to Aronos. Yeah, we're going to get into that, don't you worry. Yeah, you're just going to spend the rest of the hour on the Titanomachy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the wrapping up for most of what I can find within Mesopotamian mythology. So what I think is probably a smart move now is for us to talk about Egyptian dragon figures. Uh, yep, yep. I'm going to Egyptian ones. They, they'd be roughly, some of these would be roughly contemporary with the 
<clears throat> some of these would be roughly contemporary with Sumerian dragons. Yeah. You know, give it give or take about half a millennia. Well, what's interesting is that Egypt and Sumeria at certain points in time were aware of each other. Not not all the time, but there was some cross pollination between the two cultures at times. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some similarities. Yeah, well, in, in this case, I think because the the big draconic figure in Egypt would be Apep or Apophis, and mm. from what I can gather, he was unlike Tiamat. He was always considered to be evil. He was the arch enemy of the sun god Ra, um, and would every night try and kill Ra. And that that's the the main part of his story is the variations on how he would try and kill Ra. Essentially, Ra sailed around the world, or around the sky, as it were, in a large boat, the solar boat. And when he got onto the night side of the world, that was when Apep could actually attack him. And so Ra had to be protected by all of the other gods, including, strangely enough, Set, even though he was hmm, well known as yeah, that's interesting. a god of chaos and you know was the one who killed not Amun-Ra, who who killed Osiris, and yet for some reason Set is still actually protecting Ra the Sun God. Yeah, that's 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 kind of one thing I did find through going through a lot of these accounts is that in a lot of these earlier mythologies, because they're not so set, you do like find people having very out of character moments here and there. Also pun intended, not so set. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that smart, unfortunately. You could have gotten away with saying yes, it was deliberate. Yeah, well, I think the thing to remember with me is if you ever see me or hear me doing anything clever, it was never intentional. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this one, I've just checked my dates because I forgot when the Middle Kingdom... Egypt. Well, this one um, was from the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, which were, ended in 1782. Because I didn't want Charles correcting me on the dates <laughs> by getting that wrong, because <laughs> he's going to do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know the exact date, but I would know that that's around the start of the Second Intermediate Period in Egypt. Yeah. That's where the uh, kind of the Hiscos and people referred to as the Asiatics invaded Egypt um, and kind of took over Northern Egypt. Uh, but I will go into that shortly. I've got a reason. Cool. Um, so yeah, the, in this era, the Middle Kingdom era was when he was first mentioned by name, but he was, much like Tiamat, he was believed to have been a primordial god he was believed to have been born out of chaos and existed since the beginning of time and so when the other gods formed and took on their duties such as Ra carrying the sun around the world etc that would be when I presume his motive was to return the universe back to chaos by swallowing the sun and bringing back darkness which might be why Set in this case was on the side of the gods because we don't I don't want the world destroyed. Messing around with humans is too fun. <laughs> that would be vaguely logical for Seth as a villain. It's like when uh, Loki and Thor team up in the Marvel films against the bigger villain, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's, I, I, I'm a villain, but destroying everything would, wouldn't really be part of my plan. Yeah, so. I, mean, I, I mean, sorry to have brought it down to such a low cultural level, but um, yeah, I mean, that does appear... In a few different things. I mean, I'll probably mention that when we come on to kind of the Norse mythology. You do kind of get people teaming up unexpectedly. Yeah, the, the Norse one, the Norse mythology is strange for that. For... Yeah. But yeah, I'll leave leave that leave that to you later on. But yeah, Set, much like these images of Tiamat that you've shown, Set was pictured as a very long snake. I will just find you the correct image because I have am images in a different order. So the long, the long serpent at the bottom would be Apep attacking the solar boat, and sorry, I'm stood too far away from your screen to be able to point out where Set is on that. Sorry, <laughs> it is a, such a small image. Yeah. yeah, sorry, it was it was the best I could find because I I was running out of time at this point. So yeah, Set was thought to be the only one who could actually harm Apep. I say harm Apep, unlike. Unlike even the other gods, could never be destroyed because he was this primordial being of chaos. But Set was the only one who could actually keep him at bay, um, and so it was up to him to protect the solar boat um, all through the night. On the other hand, there's a different version where 
Apep could hypnotize all of the other gods, but Set was the only one who could actually who could actually resist. Mm. And so Set was carrying a great spear which he would use to pierce the sides of Apep and drive him off. Other versions have Apep as trapping the boat, essentially coiling around it like a python, um, and trapping the boat and Set having to essentially wrestle the boat free. Um, there is apparently one was apparently one version where Apep and Set were considered to be the same god, and they had an army of gods that were attacking the solar boat rather than it just being Set himself as Apep himself in serpent form. Apparently, an army of other gods and the dead um, would fight against Apep to help protect help protect the boat. So, as as it was in the un- underworld, the gods would call upon the dead to aid them against against Apep and Set. In this same version, if Apep did sw- successfully swallow the sun god, the dead were actually able to harm him by cutting a hole in the belly of the snake and letting him out that way. That's kind of interesting because there is a bit of a motif as you go further through the development of the dragon, like draconic figure, of occasionally you do get uh, heroic stories where the hero kind of loses and has to be cut out of the serpent or the serpent has to disgorge them due to someone else's action. It's more common than you'd think, and this this might be kind of a genesis point. Yeah, and and you see similar things to that outside of dragon mythology as well, like the obvious one being Jonah and the whale. Yeah, that's uh, being the 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 motif of being swallowed and and captured by a gigantic beast. It's quite a, quite a common one. Perhaps this this particular Egyptian story of the the sun itself being swallowed was what then was what then inspired later on stories of humans being swallowed by these giant beasts. Potentially. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, I, I, I'm I, not up on the knowledge enough to say one way or the other. But, uh, it is an interesting theory. Yeah, and the other main theory about a- the times when Apep succeeded in swallowing, in swallowing the sun, it's thought that that might actually be um, what the Egyptians believed was happening during an eclipse. Oh, yeah, that would make sense, actually. Because I... Um... I think I saw this in like a Russian folkloric dragon where one of its powers was that it was uh, eclipses were caused by it temporarily swallowing the sun. Yeah, yeah, and so then the end of the eclipse would be when the army of the dead successfully cut the sun free. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and Apep may also then be sort of a early form of a lot of other dragons that were thought to encircle the world because that was where Apep was believed to exist surrounding the entire world. So he he may be a precursor to Yormagund, or to, I think there was another African one that I've got in my notes, that was also referred to as encircling the world. So Apep may be a precursor there. So this is kind of the origin of the term that we'd call the, is it the Ouroboros? Um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is the, the recurring imagery throughout various world societies of a coiled snake grasping its own tail. Yes, our Rob or Ross. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. That that's the red dwarf quote. Oh, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, um, when Lister went back in time and became his own dad and just wrote the word Ouroboros on the box that he was right. in, and his and his yeah, adopted okay. parents misread it as our Rob or Ross, and thought that was his name. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just don't remember any of that. Com- yeah, going completely lowbrow there, red dwarf. <laughs> yeah, let's go off the rail and talk about red dwarf for the next yeah. hour. But yeah. The- I don't know if I could even do that. I don't remember <laughs> enough of it. I probably could. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's the uh, shows what we do all day. Stay at home, watch old BBC TV shows. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, steer the ship onwards. <laughs> uh, so over to so, you. <laughs> yes, so i kind of building on some of this initial imagery that we've seen, both with the Egyptian examples that you just gave and with the Mesopotamian examples I gave. Now, the reason that I found this quite interesting is, so the myth of Marduk and Tiamat, its precise dating is a little difficult to tell. It's definitely known to have existed from about the 12th century BC onwards, but it's thought that looking at some iconography found uh, in other Babylonian sites, it may have existed back as far as the Kassite dynasty of Babylonia. So this is kind of 18th, 17th century BC. And this is a dynasty that, if if this story originates with them, it has ties to a much wider body 
of mythology that may not even be originally in Mesopotamia. So the Kassites are an unusual people. On one hand, they speak a, like an Indo-Iranian language that's kind of difficult to classify, but their rulers clearly have what's called in, like what's termed Indo-European names. So for those of you not aware, I've got an image up here for you, Crofty. The Indo-European languages are a broad kind of family of languages that spreads across kind of the Russian steppe all the way through Europe up until the very fringes where you still have a few kind of Celtic languages existing, all the way towards the east, uh, towards Siberia, down into India, into Iran, and kind of by a roundabout way back up into Mesopotamia. This dispersion of languages for a long time was interest was kind of interesting to linguists who were thinking there's probably a common origin point here culturally. And the question for a long time was, was this due to cultural spread of a language? Um, it simply, for whatever reason, became dominant and spread throughout these regions? Or, the far more interesting theory, if I do say my, so myself, is, is this a case of mass migration? Hmm. And if so, where from? So it has been thought for a kind of a good half century now that there was a degree of migrations throughout uh, the Indo-European subcontinent that probably originated somewhere in the Russian steppe. This is referred to as the Proto-Indo-European homeland. And it's thought that somewhere from around 4000 BC onwards, different groups from this region, different groups of people who were characterised by being largely nomadic and using wheeled carts, started to migrate elsewhere into both Western Europe and then south into India and into Iran and eventually through that way into Mesopotamia. For a long time, this was quite controversial. And it was for, you know, it, in recent years, there was kind of a pushback and it was saying, no, this is probably a cultural diffu diffusion rather than mass migration. In the last 10 years, there's been a whole bunch of ADNA or ancient DNA studies that have basically confirmed that this was a mass migration. There's a significant turnover in Western Europe of people suddenly having far greater amounts of steppe ancestry. Uh, that clearly comes from somewhere in the region of kind of just north of the Black Sea, which is north of Turkey. And it's thought that many of the myths uh, that is present within the rest of Europe come from these regions as a result. One of these uh, kind of common motifs found within these regions where it's thought that there was an Indo-European uh, migration which may even actually include the Hiskos that I mentioned to you earlier, Crofty, in Egypt from the second um, intermediate period. It's one theory is that they were actually Indo-Europeans or people displaced by Indo-European migrations. Yeah. A very common motive within their mythology is, by common I mean literally every single one of these cultures has it, is an image of a hero who is in some way associated with thunder or storms or great strength in, con in contest with a serpent of some type. So Tiamat is probably the earliest extant version of one of these myths that's clearly kind of traced the Indo-European uh, legacy. There's clearly some crossover going there because, as you said, with the example of Apep in Egypt, there's quite a few of the similar attributes going on. So it, to some extent, it probably is influenced by common tropes that are just within human consciousness. Yeah. But this kind of is a good explanation point as to why almost every example I have for dragons going forwards now in Europe involves this myth. And this myth is called, I think, oh, if I find it, the Chaos Camp, which is a term that was... Uh, coined by an Old Testament scholar, Hermann Gunkel. It was actually quite difficult for me to figure out who termed it. I had to go to a... I'm telling this for a reason. I had to go to a master's thesis from someone... I think, I'm think i not going to name the thesis because I don't want to embarrass the person. But I started reading this master's thesis, which was about this theory. 
I got about six pages in and was thinking, oh, this is pretty good. This is a good distillation of all this information in one place. That's really handy. I can't wait to cite this. And then on page six, the words My Little Pony appeared. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It started to argue that the Chaos Camp is a central theme within My Little Pony. Okay. Someone spent their money on getting a master's degree, and that's what they chose for their thesis. <laughs> well, you could say that, that My Little Pony is modern mythology. Yeah. You know. It... Fr- friendship is magic, or whatever the hell the name of that thing is. Teaches good values to children about friendship and love. I mean, I wouldn't know because I'm an adult and I've never seen it. That's entirely just my assumption from the title being called Friendship is Magic, it, that it yeah. must teach good values of friendships, children. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, uh, that was my brief derailment there. But I, I don't know how much further the thesis went on that topic because after half a page, I was like, I'm just going to put this to one side. It's, yeah. But um, the good news is that there are plenty of examples of this chaos camp within Indo-European mythology. So in addition to the example of Tiamat I gave, there is a whole bunch of early kind of Anatolian and uh, Syrian and Mesopotamian gods who follow the pattern of this myth. So the example I was going to give is it's usually a storm god of some type. And because the religions of these areas at the time were much more forgiving of um they were kind of equal in that they they would say oh yes this other god that this other people's worship is clearly the same god as ours but under a different name uh, they, it was very egalitarian in that manner hmm. so there's a result that around the levant and anatolia there are a whole bunch of gods who are essentially the same guy who fight a serpent at some point in their myth Examples of this include a group of people known as the Hurrians, who were kind of found within what was kind of like northern Mesopotamia, Syria, eastern Anatolia. Uh, they're most they're mostly known for like a kingdom known as Mitanni at the time, which is a little obscure, but it was like a major kingdom. Their god is a figure known as Teshub, and he is very clearly a storm god in the vein of the Chaos Camp. And he contends with a serpentine creature called the Il- Ilyuyanka, or however it's pronounced. So there are very close parallels between that and a later group of people. So to the west of there in Anatolia, you have a group of people known as the Hittites. One of their chief gods is a storm god again called Tahuna. Again, begins with a T. Uh, who contends with another serpentine monster whose name, I think it's I think it's Lotan is the name. Uh, Oh, that might be one of the other ones. But again, he contends with a serpentine dragon-like creature and is victorious. And then the final kind of one of these kind of big three in this region is the Canaanite, or is it Canaanite? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I think it's Canaan, but I could be wrong. Yeah, the Canaanite god of Habab Baal, or just Hadab. Now, he's very interesting. So he, again, is just another storm god who contends with the great dragon Lotan. But where this is probably interesting for most people, and where it gets kind of controversial, is that this conflict seems to have influenced another conflict between a regional Israelite god known as Yahweh, who contends with an entity known as Leviathan. So anyone who knows your Old Testament right now, uh, those names are pretty familiar. Hmm. So this this is the Yahweh of the Bible. So Yahweh is an interesting example. Before he became co-opted into the kind of Old Testament and uh, Jewish and Israelite faith, he was just a regional storm god, essentially. And he was not considered in the vein of like the sing the singular god that there is that exists. So up until I think the Babylonian captivity, which is like sixth century BC, he is regularly kind of presented alongside of a god in this kind of egalitarian manner that I mentioned. So that's kind of the more controversial one of them. 
But yeah, Leviathan features within the Old Testament. Um, it has a lot of parallels with Hadad's contention with the great dragon Lotan. So in the Ugaritic tradition of Lotan, um, where he's called Lotanu, um, he's referred to as a twisting serpent and the powerful one with seven heads, which is very similar to some later iconography in the Bible as well. And the name of Leviathan is is somewhat of a cognate with Lotanu as well. But yes, in in the Bible, kind of Yahweh's destruction of the Leviathan is very much kind of presented in the chaos camp. Uh, in Isaiah 27, 1, Yahweh's destruction of the Leviathan, it's foretold very much as his like impending overhaul of the universal order. And it's very much within that Indo-European tradition. Yeah, that's that's kind of where you see this this conflict kind of starting to become codified within the Middle East. And that's kind of before you start getting to like Greece, that's that's kind of the early evolution of this sort of myth. Hmm. Okay, so now I've done going over the more controversial stuff. Uh, let's take a nice diversion and look at a possible independent origin points for dragons in China. Well, I was originally going to go into the independent origin in China and going into all this Thunder God fighting a dragon stuff actually just brought me around to thinking, should we go into Susano and the Eight-Headed Dragon in Japan? Right. Um, which uh, completely ruined your, your plan of how to make it flow. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it kind of makes sense, as you're saying, um, you know, that this Thunder God versus Dragon story spread from the Middle East throughout Europe and Russia. And you also get r- roughly the same story in Japan. Which hmm. is strange, given that you know, one, it's an island nation. It was very, very separated from the West for so you know, until like the fifteenth century or something. They weren't seeing any Westerners. The only potential point of migration was Russia um, from hmm. anywhere in the West, and it was mostly influenced by China. And yet, you and yet the story of Susano killing Yamato no Orochi does have. Essentially, the the same two players of the thun the thunder god and the multi headed dragon. I mean, in I, I was less prepared for this one actually because I was prepared to go into China, but it was yeah. mu- it fits much more after what you've been saying. So, Susano, he was the brother of Amaterasu, the sun goddess, and generally referred to as queen of the gods and mother of the gods. Um, and he was a much more destructive force, being a thunder god. He was known for destroying forests and mountains and kill, killing humans and was banished from heaven for that reason. He caused destruction of the palace of the sun as he bid farewell to his sister. Um, and he somehow actually caused Amaterasu get, to get exiled as well. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's part of the main story or just a side story of him because there's a bit less detail on that from what I could find. Basically, he he challenged he challenged her to prove that prove that his intentions were good through creating creating five new gods, and if they were all if they were all male, that was meant to be proof that they were his that his intentions were good. It's a bit of a strange bit of a strange a strange one to read. Yeah, so, that's. I imagine there's some context there that we're missing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what's what's the quote? I've got. Amaterasu was convinced her brother was up to no good, but when challenged, Susano claimed that he merely wanted to say goodbye and to prove his good intentions. He said that if he could miraculously bring into the world five new deities and they turned out to be male, it would prove his honesty. So he then mm. he then took the jewel necklace from his sister, ate the jewels from it, and spat them out as a mist from which five male deities were born. These these new gods are Kami, along with three female gods produced when Amaterasu performed a similar feat by eating Susano's sword became the ancestors of the Japanese nobility. Following that, after winning the challenge, he went on a rampage to celebrate. He destroyed trees and rice fields and mountains and a divine horse. And because of this, because of this, Amaterasu exiled herself um, right. within, within a cave and only came out after the other gods um, begged her to return. And after this, Susano then finally actually went to Earth in exile, 
So yeah, he landed in the province of Izuma, and while wandering along the river He, he came across three figures who were crying, an old man, an old woman, and their young daughter. The older people told the god of their distress caused by a gigantic serpent, Yamato no Orochi, or the Koshi, which had come to terrorise the region every year, and every visit ate one of the aged couple's daughters. And so they were down to their last daughter, who is Kushana, Kushanada Hime. The Hime means princess, which makes me wonder a bit about about if there's more context to this that um, my research is missing, because I know Hime is princess. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Susano struck a bargain with them. If he killed the dragon, he could marry the beautiful girl. So maybe a bit more selfish than some of the other other Thunder God yeah. myths. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, some of the later ones are like, there's, I'm going to go into it, obviously, but there are a few of them where it's like, yeah, I, I want your hand as my as my reward. Yeah. Yeah. And then that goes into a lot of you know, more human stories about knights and such, where their deal is if they rescue someone, they can marry her. And mm. that that's a, that's a whole different rant. <laughs> but yeah. So there is, a, so it appears that there is some parallels going on then in Japanese mythology. Uh, we'll get onto it later. There is some parallels in um, uh, Mesoamerican mythology as well. But what I think would be interesting now is we've had kind of our chaos camp session for the last half an hour or so. Well, let's hear a bit more about a potential independent origin in the form of China. Yes. Let's have a look into that. Sorry, we got sidetracked from from that a bit. <laughs> so yes, the the origin of the Chinese gods, it's well, the Chinese dragons, I mean, which are also thought to either be aspects of the gods or companions to the gods. It does seem to vary quite a bit, which leads to some confusion. But the origin of them actually comes from what was claimed in um Han Dynasty era to be the origins of China. Um, The Han Dynasty um, historian, Sima Qian, who wrote Records of the Grand Historian, a few people have sort of compared him to Herodotus in that vein, Um, he wrote of the origins of China as originating from a war between the Flame Emperor, Yandi, also known as Shenong, who was later on revered as a god of farmers because his ability to control fire, um, he used to teach teach the tribes of Ch- um, tribes of China at the time for clearing land to grow crops on um, by burning 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 all the trees, and so he became known as the Flame Emperor through that, and is considered a progenitor to one of one of these tribes that were later on united, and then in what's thought what's claimed to be the first war of Chinese history, the Battle of the Banquan. I'm very sorry for all the Chinese pronunciations that I'm buttering. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I would be no better. I'm not. I'm not too worried. <laughs> yeah, um, this... we just we'll just apologise to all language <laughs> in advance. Yeah, this was thought to be roughly 2600 to 2700 BC. So in in this, he Flame Emperor Yandi was at war with the Yellow Emperor Huangdi, who I believe the Yellow Emperor is related to um, a figure who was involved in. Stopping a flood in China's equivalent of flood myth, which is discussion for a later episode because that's going to be a, a there's going to be a lot to talk yeah. on flood myths. There's a lot of flood myths out there. It's yeah, the Bible is not the only place with a flood <laughs> myth. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So Huangdi basically intended to unite the nine tribes of China, and by unite, I would mean conquer. And his ah, first pu- his... pulling pulling a Genghis as it's known, <laughs> Chinggis. <laughs> Yeah, ching- oh damn it! I always forget. <laughs> That's one I can pronounce. <laughs> oh. uh, so yeah, through unite uniting the tribes of China at the time through conquering them, his first conquest was Yandi's tribe. Through during this battle of the Banquan, while Yandi survived, he basically was forced to surrender to the Yellow Emperor. And following this, the Yellow Emperor then went and subdued seven other tribes and so became supposedly the first emperor of China who mm-hmm. later on became deified. He was also, also just a fun aside, he was ta- he um, supposedly introduced building, taming animals, farming of grain, invention of clothing, the invention of carts, boats, the Chinese writing system, astronomy, mathematics and football. 
to the ancient Chinese. <laughs> I was going to say, because at first my complaint was going to be, I was like, how would people receive the guy who rocks up and is like, I've got a new invention, cloves. <laughs> it's going to change everything. It's like, would you be really like, what, what would, what that society, would you look at it and go, wow, it was a great idea. Or would it be like a hundred years later looking back and going, that prick, Han D, who like, made everyone worried about modesty. <laughs> but yeah. now I, I wanna I wanna hear more about the football now. That's way more interesting. <laughs> Unfortunately, the foot the football mention was just that one mention. It doesn't give any more details on this version of football that this yellow emperor who later became a dragon introduced to China. <laughs> that, that's, yeah, it's a it's an that, odd one. Yeah, that that's something for some more research. <laughs> because I, An entire episode on Huandi's football game. I want there to be a crazy story behind that. I really want there to be one, but I couldn't find one. It'll be something like a Fatty Bulger story from the Hulk bit where he like hit someone's head off so hard it went flying and went down a rabbit hole and invented golf. <laughs> that was Bullroar Took, but yes. That, that was, yeah. <laughs> Your congratulations, you have come across as more of a nerd than me. <laughs> That's, I have come across as more of a nerd than anyone. <laughs> Anyway, the, the actual story. The actual story. <laughs> um, yeah. So the Yellow Emperor, Huangdi, conquered these eight tribes and incorporated them into his own. And supposedly the the image of the dragon came from the totems of these nine tribes. So aspects of these animals that he took to become part of the dragon were the eyes of the shrimp, the antlers of a deer, the mm. mouth of a bull, the nose of a dog, the whiskers of a catfish, the mane of a lion the tail of a snake, the scales of a fish, and the claws of the hawk, which create the stereotypical Chinese dragon image that I will just pull up now. Uh, so that image that you should be seeing. Yeah, that's the uh, flag of Great Qing China. Yes, but it, it was the best public domain depiction of a Chinese dragon that I could find that very much fit the stereotype there. So yes, the, the flag of the last imperial din- dynasty before the Republic. Um, so yeah, upon the death of Huangdi, um, he supposedly became the Yellow Deity, um, which was one of the aspects of the Wufang Shangdi, which is represented by the diagram that I have yeah. there, which were the five deities or elements of Chinese mythology. He became the central one, the Yellow Deity, where there were also an azure one, there was a red one, white one, and black one. So the red, the red deity, which in that image is listed as, as Chidi, is another name for Yandi. So this red deity of fire was the very same emperor that Huangdi fought and subdued, and that became one of the one of the early dragon myths where where the two were represented as dragons, with the Huangdi as the dragon of water, subduing the dragon of fire, which. Also, mm-hmm. is thought to have been an origin for the yin yang symbol. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Where, with the idea of the water quenching the fire, but the fire also boiling the water, and so while the water yeah, did win in this case, stalemate. there was still a stalemate. Um, yeah, but yeah, that it's strange in that at some point they're considered to be historical human figures who went went to an actual human war with armies. And then later on, that very same battle is depicted as two mystical dragons bringing the elements of fire and water to bear against each other. Mm. So that that's why it can get a bit confusing because these same events are referred to in a very in a very earthly context and a very mystical context. Yeah, I mean, I found that's very similar in talk of dragons in kind of Greek mythology you get a similar parallelism going on. Yeah, the Greeks are strange with that. They sometimes seem to have a distinct heavens and earth, and then sometimes, or a distinct other world and earth, and then sometimes it's just you wander into the woods and there's some gods knocking around. Yeah, that's always one of the kind of difficult things to keep track of, because you have to remember a lot of these societies... They're not. They don't have like big rationales as to why you never see these creatures around now that were in the mythology of the past. They just consider that these are part of the actual world. So, like natural disasters 
uh, caused by the guy who was imprisoned over into this mountain over here or something like that. Yeah. It's not, you know, this, there is no different, there's no separation between the spiritual and mundane in many of these belief structures. Yeah. And that was also, also why the, the historian, Sima Kian, um, does actually claim that these dragons were real. And he, he does later on talk about dragons um, in the context of them actually helping emperors as well. So mm. um, just, just to finish the last little bit of the origin story, because the image that I've showed you like I said, shows five elements, and so far we've got two. Um, the yellow dragon, his grandchildren, I believe, form the other three. Yeah, so yeah, the, the azure dragon, Kang Long, who represents the element of wood. Um, Baidi, the white dragon, who represented metal, and the black dragon, whose name I don't have written down. The but yes, the black dragon Heidi, <laughs> um, who represented water, and the four dragons who on this image are in the four directions also represented a compass point and an ocean, while Huangdi was the central one that tied them together, and these same hmm. four of these dragons, Heidi. Heidi, Kanglong, Chidi, Oyandi, and Baidi, they also have equivalents in Japanese mythology, representing the same four elements. However, in Japanese mythology, the fifth element is void, and so there's no physical manifestation of that, and so Huangdi was eliminated entirely mm -hmm. when this version of the myth came to Japan. So mm -hmm. that's the sort of the sort of mystical origins of them as God, as godly beings, but then you know, they had many descendants which end up in more folklore or in some of the historical records supposedly aided emperors in their conquests, which I imagine was more an embellishment as a way of showing that emperor's divine right to rule by saying, yes, I've got all these dragons willing to work with me. Like the first the first emperor of the Qin mm -hmm. dynasty um, who, who united China in the third century supposedly had dragons going to war going to war alongside him whereas in, in the warring states period um there was an emperor who enlisted a man called Dongfu to train two dragons that a male and a female dragon that had descended oh this is this is sounding familiar <laughs> uh, unfortunately the version of that that i have which was out of records of the grand historian it doesn't go into much detail he was literally told told to train the dragon he did and later on one of the dragons died <laughs> oh i can't that means i can't get this into a like a tangent about the dreamworks fi picture anymore can i you can if you want because yeah my my version of records of the grand historian is very vague on what his training was so i'm taking it to mean that how to train your dragon is chinese mythology canon <laughs> yeah let's go with that <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that that film was weird. Like his the main character's voice was like an adult in the body of a kid. It was weird. Anyway, so yeah, all, all I could really get on this this Dong Fu guy, or as he was also known, Lu, Lui Ti, um, was that he was born with the the innate ability to understand the will of dragons, even though he was a commoner. So I think it might be that part of the moral of it is not judging people by the circumstances of their birth. And mm -hmm. so the emperor elevating him to the court because he had the power to understand these heavenly beings. Because he, these these may have been like the first two dragons after the five great dragons to descend to Earth. Mainly because it's like the first mention after that point of dragons in C. McKeon's records. And mm -hmm. then I have a few other um, interesting details. For, for uh, beings that were supposedly divine... The Chinese did kind of did kind of want their body parts to use for good luck, which was a strange one. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Like, um, we'll get into this when I go to North American dragons, but it's like, oh yeah, this this like this dragon over here, he's he's fine. He doesn't hate humans. He's all right. Don't worry about him. Oh, his horns are really good for treating this disease. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> see, so, some some versions in the Chinese one, they at least ask nicely. And some versions it is bribery, and some versions taking it. Like the one again, th this one does actually show up in C. McKeon's records, and again, it's literally just a one-page um, mention of these dragons, and that conclude concludes the entire story. In that these the two dragon monarchs of Laos visited one of the Zhou, Z H O U, 
I know I'm never going to pronounce that correctly. Ja- oh, the uh, the Chow Dynasty. Chow, there we go. The Chow Dynasty. So ZH and Q are both pronounced CH in Chinese. Ah, there we go. Yeah, the, the Chinese pronunciations were the ones I struggle with most. Japanese I can do easily enough because it's simple syllables, but Chinese I've always struggled. Yeah, Chinese is a bit of a crazy one. If you are an, like, if you're like us, you're from Western and Southern Yorkshire, which isn't real Yorkshire, by the way. Um, you can barely speak. You can barely speak English. About right. <laughs> like we're uh, gonna struggle when it comes to something that's got an entirely different alphabetical system to ours. Where they don't talk right proper, like what I does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the Chow Emperor. He was visited, no justification for this visit, by the two dragon monarchs of Laos. Um, He prayed to them and requested that he could take some of their sputum to bring about good fortune. And they they kindly gave him some. It didn't really go into any detail of whether he then got good fortune, apart from the fact that his dynasty lasted for a good few generations. So I suppose that would be the case. (laughs) That's a weird one if you know the actual Chow Dynasty history, but I'm not gonna not gonna derail the conversation, don't worry. I would not say that was a well fated dynasty. <laughs> yeah. I I I guess it would just be that it was a very short term. <laughs> Good fortune, I'm not sure. If anyone wants to know more about that, look up summer and autumn period. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Unfortunately my knowledge start starts with um the Unification War and the Kin Dynasty. Um a bit rusty yeah. before before that point. So yeah, that's just one example. A different example would be a story in which um, in which an emperor had his people bribe a dragon, a descendant of one of the, descendant of, of the dragon of the east, the green or blue dragon, um, in order to get the pearls from underneath that dragon's chin, which are thought to be part of the source of the dragon's power, and the dragons would sometimes fight with each other to acquire more of them and become more powerful. And Ooh. so in this case, he, after one of his subjects, discovered the lair of one of these lesser dragons. The emperor sent his people to go and bribe this dragon. Um, she was the daughter of the eastern dragon in order to give up a wishing pearl and two black mm. dragon pearls. So the the wishing pearl, supposedly, grant, the first class one supposedly cast a radiance for 40 miles, a second class one a radiant light for 20 miles, and a third for 10 miles. And as far as their radiance carried, neither wind nor rain, thunder nor lightning, water, fire, nor weapons may reach. According to the folktale, uh, the pearls of the black dragon are are nine coloured and glow by night. And within the circle of their light, the poison of serpents and worms is powerless. And then he also requested several lesser serpent pearls and mussel pearls, which are just multicoloured and shine by night, but no other major powers. So, mm-hmm. dragons start off as very divine, and only emperors may treat with them, and they bring rain, and they control the seas, and control the weather, and, you know, anger them at your peril. And then you've got a guy bribing them for pearls. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting that... So, early dragons are very much kind of associated with the weather. They're associated with the seas, with lakes, with thunder, that sort of thing. Which is probably why, in the Indo-European example, they're paired with a thunder god, to some extent. Um, I know the the whole point of the myth is kind of they're the primeval force of nature and he's the kind of order overcoming them. But there is also interesting parallels between both sides of that conflict. Right, well, I think that's been plenty of China. Let's talk about ancient Greece. Yes. We left off me kind of talking about the Indo-European uh, kind of chaos camp. How it looks like is that the dragons of Greece are kind of a hybrid. They kind of appear to have been influenced both by Indo-European forts and they've been influenced by Egyptian and Mesopotamian forts on dragons. And that makes sense because, you know, for a very, very long period of their, like since the Bronze Age, Egypt and the Middle East, the, the Near East, was really their major trading partners and there would have been a lot of cultural osmosis as a result. So what we actually have is a bit of a gap between many of the Bronze Age deities that I mentioned before, you know, Hadad and the Hittite god and uh, uh, Yahweh and that. There's a little bit of a gap. And the the reason why is that after about 1200 BC, 
Greece just goes into a complete dark age. It lasts for about 400 years or so. So you don't see the return of writing in Greece until the very end of the 9th century. It's when you see like the city-states start to appear and you kind of get into archaic Greece, um, which is when the kind of earliest accounts of dragons within their mythology emerge from. So the main source that we have of the earliest features, uh, the earliest appearances, should I say, of dragons within Greek mythology is Hesiod. The very first accounts of dragons within Greek mythology appear within Hesiod's Theog- uh, is it Theogony? I think so, yeah. I, I, yeah, I struggle with pronouncing a lot of these yeah, words. I think, uh, I think Greeks gonna be always with... had the hard G. So yeah, Theogony yeah. rather than Theogony, I think. Yeah. Like the, the initial appearance of a dragon-like being within Greek mythology is after Zeus, as you mentioned beforehand, he contends with his own father, uh, Cronus, and the other Titans as part of the, the great war in the heavens of the Titanomachy. He exiles the Titans to Tartarus, which is like the Greek underworld, and is again kind of one of these primeval force of nature places much like Gaia and um, kind of like uh, Eros and other figures within Greek mythology. And immediately afterwards, this is like the final tacked on extra opponent before the cosmic order gets kind of arrayed. Suddenly Gaia, in revenge for the defeat of her son, uh, Cronus, which is kind of strange because he castrated her consort, suddenly brings forth the entity known as Typhon. So, as you mentioned beforehand, I think you're a bit familiar with this, the contention of Zeus and Typhon. Yeah, yeah. The primary story, basically, is that Typhon is an entity birthed by Gaia, but in some accounts is also considered to be associated with Hera, which was Zeus's very, very jealous wife. Um, And the reason that's given for why she kind of nursed Typhon is given that apparently she was angry at Zeus for having managed to give birth to Athena by himself. Because Zeus got around. He did did strange things. Though, te- no. giving birth to Athena by himself doesn't count as getting around. Because it's yeah. all, it's all oh. him. <laughs> it's one of the rare occasions where Zeus didn't get around. Well, it was kind of like in his vein of... Uh, he was like emulating his father. I think he like swallowed Athena's mother or something like that. And then he had such a pounding headache, he had his skull split open and Athena emerged. Um, Yeah, that's right. Her mother had shapeshifted into a fly, and Zeus shapeshifted Mm. into, I think, a frog or a lizard of some sort, and caught her in his long tongue. But where Typhon then comes back into things is Typhon basically is the last great foe of Zeus before, as I said, the Cosmic Order is sorted out. And he is envisioned as being a giant being with a hundred heads in some accounts. Um, mostly these are demonstrated to be the heads of a snake or a dragon, and often they will be breathing fire. In addition to like the Anzu bird and stuff, this is one of the earlier associations of fire breathing with the draconic myth within the West, at least. I think um, Leviathan and Lotan also uh, breathe fire. Alternative depictions also have Typhon as a winged humanoid. I think most people are I'm probably going to be more familiar with that if you see it anywhere. So Zeus's contention with Typhon, it's one of those things where you kind of get two lines saying, oh, look how incredibly destructive and powerful Typhon is. And then in somewhat typical Zeus fashion, he leaps off of Olympus, smashes him in the head and wins. (laughs) Which sums up a lot of Zeus's battles, really. He's a bit overpowered, unfortunately. So... He succeeds in defeating Typhon and he casts him down. In some versions, I mean, in Hesiod, he's cast him down into Tartarus with the rest of the Titans. In other versions, I think Pindar or some of the other Greek poets basically say he is Mount Etna. He's the reason why it's a volcano. Hmm. He's imprisoned underneath and the rumbling is him trying to escape. Yeah, I think that's the version I heard where he was imprisoned underneath the mountain itself. Uh, Because Greek mythology is a weird place. It it kind of evolves a little bit as well. So most of the stereotypical, well, not stereotypical, the generic stories 
you're going to hear from Greek mythology are going to be from, I think, the second millennium, the uh, second century AD. And they're going to be in the account of a guy. Oh, it's like it's 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 one of these awkward circumstances where he it's it's attributed to a guy called Ap- it Apoll- Apollonian or something like that. I'm trying to find it here in my notes, but it's attributed to this guy, and it's since been shown that it's not. It definitely hasn't been written by him. We actually don't know who it is, but it provides like a good summary of all of Greek myth. Hmm. But because there's a huge gap of time between Hesiod and him and all the developments in between, there is some variety in Greek mythology that you're going to see. Typhon, say, was yeah Zeus's last great opponent, and then he's cast down into Tartarus. But his legacy going forward um, is kind of as kind of as the father of monsters from that point onwards. He's presented as having a partner in the this this kind of monstrosity known as Echidna. <clears throat> These entities are well, basically between them they produce every major monster of Greek mythology. This includes things like Cerberus, the monster which. Um, Guards Hades, uh, or the underworld. You've got the um, Linnaean Hydra. You've got the Chimera, the Sphinx, the Nemean Lion. <laughs> yeah, the Skylet. Most of the major monsters of Greek mythology come from this entity. And several of these creatures are obviously draconic in nature. Hmm. There's a very clear pedigree, shall we say. Although I'm not sure where the dogs that they gave birth to came from. Yeah, well, Kerberos, Cerberus. Um, did have the same multi-headed aspects as the others. Yeah, that's but, a good point. He's three-headed. But going from reptile to mammal is is a bit odd. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a jump. But, um, yeah, so moving kind of on from Zeus, I had a bit of a quandary. I was thinking, do I show these in kind of order of reporting of these myths, or do I report them as, like, what what's the earliest figure within Greek mythology who is recognisably a heroic figure and not a god? I decided to go with the latter. So the first figure within Greek mythology who is presented as contending with a kind of dragon-like figure, in fact, is is kind of explicitly called a dragon, Draconez, in this, or Dracon in this circumstance, is the figure of Cadmus. He is kind of the original Greek hero. He's shown as the figure who became the heroic archetype that everyone emulated going forwards. He's basically described as the founder of Thebes. He he's got a very strange backstory. So he he is described as a Phoenician prince. So Phoenicia was a nation on kind of within like north of the Levant um that basically sired Carthage and a couple of other nations. But it's kind of a strange anomaly here. There's no real known relation between the role of him being a Phoenician and what's actually known about Greek history. In Cadmus's story, he founds Thebes on the instructions of Apollo, who basically says, you have to follow this heifer and found a city wherever it is laid down. So he and his men go forward, they follow the heifer, and they find a spring. Unfortunately, this spring is guarded by a dragon. This dragon is like explicitly identified with the god Ares, and it's referred to as the dragon of Ares. And this dragon goes on to slay Cadmus's companions. However, this, in a great example of the Chaos Camp, is becomes like the major antagonist for Cadmus. Cadmus defeats it in a couple, in one of two ways. He either smashes it in the head with a rock or he just uses his sword. It's quite a brief description in the Hesiod. Um, And having killed the creature, he, for some reason, decides to tear out the creature's teeth and sew them. So he was acting on the advice of of Athena for this. And, well, this is one of those aspects of myths that has been conflated on and added to a whole bunch of other Greek myths and turns up in almost, like, in a jumbled fashion in, in plenty of popular adaptations of Greek stories. So in sowing these dragon's teeth, an army of giant warriors grows from the ground like plants. Uh, then referred to as the Spartoi, which means the sown men, and Cadmus is actually quite afraid of them. So rather than confronting them directly, he hurls a bunch of stones into their midst, which 
causes them to quarrel and fight each other, and eventually there are only five of them left. Problem is, the account of that I found of this just sort of drops that whole point there. I don't know what happens to those giants at this point. Mm. Yeah, you'd, you'd think the name, it would they would have used them as an origin for the Spartans. But yeah, they, they may well they may well have. Unfortunately, I, I didn't have a really a chance to look into it. Yeah, I mean, I st- I've heard the story as well um, from a few different few different sources. The most recent version that I read was Stephen Fry retelling in Mythos, and he again, from what I remember, doesn't say say that they have any relation to the Spartans, even though the names are so similar. This yeah. does seem a logical progression. Hmm. It's the sort of thing where you'd think someone would have. Where there must be no record anywhere in the Greek canon of the Spartans having that as their origin story, otherwise that would have become common knowledge. Really, I mean, just... it may just have been a similar word. That's yeah, all it is. yeah. But yes, um, so I mentioned before that this dragon was identified with Ares, and uh, perhaps for good reason. Ares was not impressed at having had his dragon slain, uh, and in kind of the proto kind of servitude or labour of a hero, Cadmus becomes his servant for eight years. I couldn't find much information as to what exactly goes on in those eight years, but I do know at the end of it, he marries Harmonica, who is Ares' daughter. So it it seems to have gone quite well. After that, Cadmus and Harmonica move on to uh, elsewhere in Greece, and they rule as king and queen over, is it, Illyria? I'm I'm very bad at Greek pronunciations. Uh, Illyria, yeah. Yeah, Illyria. The weird element that ends this story, though, is they suddenly appear at the end of it as being transformed into dragons themselves. Hmm. That's an odd one. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it is very rare for hum- for from what I've seen, for, for humans to transform into dragons. They are, have always been, in most cultures, very separate things. Yeah. Well, I thought that was interesting just to bring up because, as you were saying in the various Chinese stories that you mentioned, there is the motif of kind of people who were presented as like warriors or earthly emperors then being transformed into into kind of dragon-like entities later on. Yeah, that's it. With with the Chinese ones, it seems to be it's only only that one case of these two founding humans who may have been gods at the time and. It's unclear what whether their war was a human war, seen as a human war, and they became dragons later, or whether they were dragons at the time, and the human war was a much more the human war was sort of concurrent with the battle between the dragons. O- other than those two, there doesn't seem to be many depictions of humans becoming, and like I say, the Chinese one, it was part of the entire origin of the Chinese the Chinese pantheon. Mm. Yeah, I found it kind of interesting because um, I think I found a grand total of one other example of this occurring, and it's yeah, it's not really for it's for a very different reason, shall we say? But I I will come to it eventually. Okay. Um, so moving on, I'm aware we've been going for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, the archetypical draconic creatures of all Greek mythology, despite the ones which I've mentioned there, it's got to be the creatures encountered by Heracles known as Hercules in Roman uh, kind of retellings of the myths. Hmm. There are kind of two creatures that Heracles encounters. Some very quick backstory on who Heracles was. I think you actually you do actually need a little bit of this because I think most people, including me until now, their knowledge of Heracles is, oh, the Disney film Hercules. Yeah. Which is not a great grounding. Or the Kevin Sorbo series, if you have, oh, re- if you have really bad taste. Yeah, oh, the nineties. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the um, the background kind of of Hercules. So it's kind of convoluted. So Hercules is the son of the woman known as Al- Alcmen, or I can't remember how. I can't figure out how to pronounce this one. Alcmene, something like that. His siring is a little. It it casts Zeus, if possible, in an even worse light than all of his other depictions throughout Greek mythology. And that, that's that's saying something. Hmm. Um, this is the guy who likes to transform into swans to get people pregnant. And bulls. Uh, yeah. yeah, and bulls. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's a new low, even for him. Yeah, this one's pretty bad. So what happens was uh, Alcmene was married to a woman named An- Amphitryon. Or Amphitryon, something like that. 
What basically happened was that Zeus came back to her, came to her in disguise, claiming that he was her husband back from war, and basically rapes her. Like it's like one of those where yeah, they had sex, but clearly one person is being deceived here. Hmm. So yeah, that's Zeus looking pretty bad. Add the complications further. Her husband comes back later the same day. Wow. And impregnates her again. <laughs> so eventually, um, what happens is that a lot of people don't really know this. Heracles has a twin brother. I think he's called Im- Impha, I P H A. Hmm. And. Him existing is immediately a problem from that most reasonable and sane of people, Hera. <laughs> who, you know, was kind of a victim blamer. Let's put it out there. Um, like, Zeus is the bad guy, not the people he's, like, forcibly slept with a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> but um, merely existing, being an illegitimate child of Zeus, it gave proof to the fact that he was an adulterer. And Hera like quite obviously wanted revenge for this. Did she not so go on Jeremy Kyle? Actually, attempts to prevent <laughs> get a DNA test. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah, get a DNA test. <laughs> Is my son even if it says he in? <laughs> but yeah, but yes, he uh, basically what happens is she initially attempts to prevent both him and his brother's birth, but fails. And in anticipation of her revenge, Hercules, uh, Heracles is, I'm going to do that all the time. Heracles's mother basically exposes him in the grand old Spartan tradition, and he's saved by his half sister Athena. And this is where it gets kind of convoluted. He's brought up to Hera, and Hera doesn't recognize him, which is a bit of an oversight. Um, and she like nurses him and. Thanks to ingesting her divine milk, he gains like his. That's where his supernatural powers come from. They're not innate. Hmm. Uh, well, at least in the version I was reading, and basically what happens is he suckles so strong that he causes incredible pain, and she forces him away. And eventually, he is returned to his mother and foster father, and Hera, not over the whole thing, then sends the two serpents that try and kill him in his crib. So I was kind of debating whether this really qualifies as draconic imagery um because it's they are explicitly named as serpents and in all various um identifications of it of the scene they are depicted as as serpents they're not they're not depicted as as dragon-like creatures yeah but where this becomes more significant i'll try and keep this brief so heracles grows up to marry the daughter of the king of, of thebes which is megara this is not the most star-studded of romances because later Hera, dri- Hera intervenes and drives Heracles into a rage and he ends up slaughtering both his wife and children. That didn't make it into the Disney movie. No, it did not. Um, maybe that was the idea for the sequel that never happened. Hmm. But he comes to his senses and flees to the Oracle at Delphi. So the Oracle at Delphi was like, the, I think she was known as the Pythia. Um, she was, con- yeah, she was just considered like this heavenly conduit for the gods, and um, Delphi was considered like the center of the Greek world. And she basically sets him to go and serve the king of Tyrans. Uh, is it Eurystheus? Eurystheus. I was never sure um, on that one. Yeah, it's a little. Yeah, and as you can tell, we're bad at this pronunciation, Mark. Um, so Eurystheus sets him ten labors. So this is the famous ten labors of Hercules of Heracles. And two of two of these creatures he encounters over the course of these labors are often presented as dragons, in one case are explicitly labelled as a dragon. The first of these is the most famous, it's probably the most identified, and probably one of the like most recognizable elements of all Greek mythology. This is the Hydra. So this is a serpentine like creature with multiple heads that produces venom. And that has like this reproductive uh, capability. So if you slice, oh, sorry, re- regenerative capability, where if you slice off its head, it will grow the head back. Now the exact form of this creature evolves over the course of Greek mythology, but you know the main version of it that comes down to us towards the end of the Greek of the classical Greek period is that it has multiple heads, and one of its heads is actually like this golden immortal head. Now, 
as I mentioned before, this is one of the creatures that was sired by a kid was by, by Echidna and Typhon. But Hera, once again, like almost all of these labors, steps in and raises this creature just with the explicit idea that it's going to kill Heracles. There is a good description in uh, um, Apollodorus's uh, summary of it, where what basically happens is Heracles is unable to defeat the Hydra with whatever weapon he has. In some accounts, it's a club. In some, it's a sickle. In some, it's a sword. Because the heads just grow back upon being incapacitated. So he kind of cheats. He calls on his nephew... Oh, this is another name. Yolus? Yeah, I think that's it. Who uses a firebrand to scorch the stump of each of these heads so it doesn't grow back. He then takes the final immortal head and severs it with a golden sword that his sister Athena gives him. And then, because it won't die, he places it still alive under a great rock. Um, so that's going to be fun when we dig that one up. I mean, we dug everything else up, but uh, he f- kind of finishes this incident by dipping his arrows in the creature's venom. What's interesting to me is this is one of the first times like, you see like a recognizable like dragon having venom rather than being a fire breather or a wind breather. Yeah, that's a that's a new one at this point. Yeah, I don't think we've had that one before. No, they're either fire, wind, or have control over water so far. Yeah, so that's kind of a new element that appears. But apart from that, this is very much in the Indo-European kind of chaos camp mold. Hmm. Heracles isn't a thunder god, but he's the son of a thunder god, and he has you know supernatural strength. Um, so he's he's still somewhat in this mold. It's essentially the sequel to Zeus versus Typhon. Yeah, I mean it's even like it's it's the revenge, the offspring coming back to get revenge, basically. Yeah. So it makes sense. Um, the second conflict that Heracles has. It comes as a direct result of him effectively cheating throughout two of the ten labors. So in addition to this, he also is set to um oh what was it? He's set to clean a set of like mythical stables, which he had to complete like in a in a night or a day or something. And he basically cheats, I think, and diverts a river to do it. As far as I remember. Creative. Yeah. And the king that he serves basically goes, uh, no. No, that you cheated. Like you'd blatantly cheated. You had your nephew help you with one of them, and the other one you didn't actually do it. The river did it. So no, you have two more labors to complete. So the eleventh labor is that where he is tasked by Eurystheus to steal the golden apples of the Hesperides. Now, in most accounts, these this this orchard where they dwell is again presented as being owned by Hera. Hera just doesn't go away when you're talking about Heracles, basically. I think she is present in almost every... I think the only thing she's not present in is there, an, there is like a precursor to the Trojan War where Heracles goes and beats up the Trojans. And I don't think Hera's in that. But apart from that, she's in almost everything to do with him. So to, he has, he's tasked to steal these golden apples, which are guarded by the dragon Ladon, which again is an offspring of Typhon. And Echidna. You you would have thought that Zeus would have done something about them, but no. The dragon Lardon, he's got kind of a variable uh, portrayal. So in some accounts, he's portrayed as just like a simple serpent entwined around the tree. And in other accounts, he's presented as being 100-headed, so keeping with the, the family trait, so to speak. So the most common version of this, Hercules actually never contends with this dragon. He captures what's termed the old man of the sea who is a really poorly attested god who's like this one of these primordial gods who just sort of appears and is later identified with different um gods that are already identified with the ocean um and this person informs him of where the garden is located there's an alternative version where it's prometheus the titan who gave fire to humanity um, and he frees Prometheus from his punishment for doing so, which is having his a liver eaten by an eagle, by just showing up and shooting the eagle with a bow. <laughs> One way of doing it. He's 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 elegant in a way, is Heracles. He just turns up and hits something. He gets the job done. Yeah, he's very much like his father. So you know, he in the most common versions. He doesn't actually go and get the apples himself. He tricks the Titan Atlas, who is tasked with holding up the sky, to going and getting the apples for him. 
uh, in his turn, he takes the weight of the skies for uh, for Atlas, and he basically has to trick the Titan into letting him to taking back the sky so he can run off with the apples going tee hee hee. The alternative version is much more direct. He just goes to the garden and shoots laid on with a bow. It's fitting with what everything else he's done so far. Yeah, it's like most of them. It's it's there. It, what what is interesting about Heracles is he has like that that consistently I show up and hit the thing attribute of early heroes. Um, but there's like a few more witty things he has to do. So the the example of him having to clean the having to clean. Uh, having to clean the stables was a, a good example of that way. He was kind of portrayed as being witty, and that's kind of a new thing for heroes in Greek mythology at that time. Yeah, I, I guess that might be attributed sort of because he's half human, half god. He sort of mm. got the got the most most strength related aspects from Zeus, and then his human side because because of the way that humans are portrayed in Greek mythology is their their advantage over everything else is their intellect. The fire that Prometheus gave them was metaphorical fire, the sp- the spark of intelligence rather than mm. literal fire, and so yeah. he's sort of sp- switching between brute strength and intellect because of his half human, half god nature. Whereas if he was pure god, he would have just just smashed everything. Yeah, I think um, that's basically everything that Heracles has to do with it. Heracles is actually killed like retrospectively by the Hydra. Is the thing like a spo- spoiler warning for Heracles' death? Um, what basically happens is he accidentally gets poisoned by the venom. I think he kills. He basically kills someone with one of his arrows, which he dipped in the venom, and then he is tricked into taking on the clothing later on. Um, so not that witty. No. But uh, anyway, so the very last thing I have to do with Greek mythology is the Golden Fleece. I don't know about you, this is one of the things I, I knew a little bit more about this than other parts of Greek mythology. Yeah, like, like I say, that that was one of my earliest expo- exposures to it. Although, we'll see how much I've forgotten when you go into it. Yeah. What basically happened... So Jason is the hero of the story of the Golden Fleece, where he is sent alongside his group of Argonauts, who are basically like the Avengers of the Greek world, um, like the big superstar team up to go and find this thing. This basic setup for Jason's story is that he is the son of the deposed king Aeson of Lolcus. Um, so Aeson was deposed by his brother Peleus. And it's kind of an arc about, you know, it's one of the early one true king arcs within mythology, where Jason is the rightful king of Lolcus, but he has to complete tasks that his he has to complete tasks that his uncle is willing to cede the throne to him. So the task which he sets for Jason is the retrieval of an item known as the Golden Fleece. This is portrayed as being a fleece that's found in a very distant land, so it's identified with like the very, very far eastern edge of Turkey on the edge of the Black Sea, um, which is a very long distance in mythological terms. Uh, like the Trojan War was a tiny fraction of the distance of travel, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. So he assembles a whole bunch of heroes, which happens to include Heracles, because Heracles can't, like, he can't not be in the story. He's like, everyone's favourite. <laughs> like, to cut to the chase, there basically is a long series of adventures and mishappenings. I think most people, or at least, well, I know of most of these, because I saw the 1963 film Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, with, with the really well-made giant skeletons. Yeah, that's an interesting film. I'd actually recommend anyone, if you want to go and kind of see a, a slightly more modern retelling of the Jason story, I would actually recommend that because it's it you know it's no great uh, piece of art in terms of the acting involved, but it has some fantastic stop motion animation in it, and I would really yeah. recommend like going and seeing that. What happens is that Jason manages to find the Golden Fleece. He arrives in Colchis, where the local king Aetes uh, tells him that it's in a copse guarded by a dragon, that take a drink is another descendant of Typhon and Echidna. So, father and mother of all monsters for you. 
It's, um, so this creature is explicitly described as a dragon, and it is described as being a giant. It is, it quotes, surpassed in breadth and length a 50-oared ship. So that's coming from Pindar's Pythian Ode. He's, this, this, this story is interesting because it has a whole bunch of like multiple resolutions to it. There's one version where Jason just slays the dragon and makes off with the Golden Fleece. In most versions, including that one, he's helped by the King of Colchester's daughter, Medea. And she that's kind of like her her origin story within Greek mythology, because she goes on to be involved in other myths as well. Hmm. In some versions, Jason is swallowed whole by the creature. Um, and it's kind of uncertain, is he killed or is he then rescued by the goddess Athena? Um, so I have a an image of this here that's quite a popular one that dates from i think the fifth century bc um there are alternative versions where he basically just puts the creature to sleep with medea's help and just steals the fleece and escapes so yeah there's a bit of a multiple choice there as to what the resolution is but most versions have jason being victorious hmm. i noticed the being being swallowed and having to be rescued from the valley of the beast shows up again it shows up again in a whole bunch of stuff. Um, what's kind of interested me about what we've discussed so far today, Crofty, is I came in thinking, oh, there's clearly not going to be that many parallels between Eastern Dragons and Western Dragons outside of kind of the basic lizard motifs because I was thinking, oh, it's such a geographical difference. But from what I've heard from what you've said today, it kind of reminds me of... It kind of makes me think these are more common traits that often come up within human imaginations. Yeah. Yeah, it's it like it still seems strange to me, even though I've known the myth for quite a while, that the, the Susano and the dragon story is basically the same as Zeus and Typhon, Thor and Yormagund, um, or Tiamat. So it's, it is an interesting one that that shows up. Outside of the Japanese mythology, I've not found it. I've not found it in the other regions that I've researched, so I've not really found it in Australia, um, the rest of Af- the rest of Africa, or New Zealand, or or in China. Really, there's not a there's not really a, you know the Thunder God already kind of showed up as while using his in his aspect of the Water God fighting the Fire Dragon, so it doesn't really show up as mm. much in China. But the fact that in the relatively isolated at the time, Japan, that same myth shows up as myths that are showing up half the world away is quite an interesting one to me. Yeah, that makes me think it's that makes me think it's kind of like a human racial memory of some sort. Like a well not a racial memory, like a, an evolutionary memory. Racial memory sounds a lot worse. <laughs> um it sounds like um yeah, like a, an evolutionary memory of some sort. I mean it, it I highly doubt that there's any direct transmission going on there just because of the isolated nature of the Japanese islands yeah. uh, versus Europe at the time. Um, I think, I mean, Europe was not, like, none of the time periods I have talked about would have had any awareness of Japan at all. In fact, I'd be surprised, I'm not sure when the earliest contacts with China were. I think it may have been with Tang China or something like that. Or Han, sorry, Han Dynasty China. Uh, I think it was even after that I'd, i think mm. um i do know that the i do know that the roman empire was did have contacts with one of the chinese dynasties and looking at the time frame between them the han dynasty is like the second century bc to the second like second and third century ad that's the most direct crossover in my mind i think i think the roman contact it was actually um i might be remembering this badly because it was i was i was reading um john mann's book about the han dynasty and the Hunu, the uh, the Hunu, the yeah. precursors to the Mongols, and that I think it was from that where he talked about um, Romans who the theory that some Romans had reached Western China and settled there, but I think I think he concluded that that was probably very unlikely. Mm. But then, on the other hand, um, a bit later on, there's evidence to sh- suggest that Attila the Hun is actually is actually descended from the Hunu people of Mongolia. And so that might be where some of the Chinese elements migrated towards Europe. Yeah, but I, I'm not a historian. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's kind of, that's quite a speculative link, obviously. But yeah, it'd be interesting. I, I will confess I've not looked into it. My knowledge of the Huns is that they were not that far east. But 
uh, my knowledge is limited, as I say. I believe it was it was thought to be a very slow migration because remember the 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 Mongolian Hunu were uh, scattered and in, either integrated into um, China itself or just scattered and not really considered a single people anymore. Would have been the first century BC, whereas Attila the Hun was a few centuries later. Yeah, I mean, any transmission would most likely be involved during Indo Indo kind of would most likely be involved in like the Indo European mythology. And that kind of spread because they kind of moved up into Siberia and kind of Mongolia areas to some like that's one of the hypothesized areas that they eventually arrived in. So there are possible links there, but very speculative. And we're not sure, I think, is the conclusion on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, Crofty, we've been going a solid two hours. And I don't know about you, but I got plenty of stuff left over. So have I. So what do you say that we make this part one? Of to be continued. Okay. Yeah, we can yeah. do that. Because I think uh, we might have a, quite a lot more to say on this. We haven't even got into Western Europe. We haven't seen anything throughout Southeast Asia or later China. We've not heard anything from the wider world. Yeah, there's most of Africa that we've not covered. We've only got Egypt. Um, mm. and we haven't, even, we haven't even got to India yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I've not got into the... Um, the theory I found on the origin of dragons within the human consciousness, as it were, um, which I'd hope to save till the end, because it does tie into two of... T- well, it ties in very directly with two of the myths that I do want to talk about. Well, we'll have to save that one for next time, I think, then. So, yeah, I think hopefully that was a, a useful starter primer of like the origins of dragons, how they started to make their way kind of out of the Middle East where their kind of independent appearance in China first turns up. Yeah. But yes, uh, unfortunately, Crofty, it seems that we have been afflicted by two potential factors. The first is the fact that every project I'm involved in immediately becomes three times longer than it needs to be. (laughs) And the second one is, of course, the Crofty effect. Yeah, there is that. It's ruined ruined science for me. It also means that I have trouble keeping history and mythology related stuff within an hour apparently (laughs) yeah that took us two solid hours i was surprised by that i hope you guys enjoyed what is effectively a pilot and uh, we'll do this again sometime soon might be a little sooner because it sounds like we've got all our research kind of done for the next section yeah yeah how do we sign off on this exactly i've never done this before (laughs) (laughs) oh everyone's first time is awkward yeah anyway (laughs) so my main way of kind of signing off for this sort of stuff is to plug everything that I do <laughs> because I'm a shameless sellout. So uh, if you're watching this on a platform other than YouTube, come over to YouTube and find me over there. I'm the Histocrat. I make videos on history very occasionally. I think I'm currently up, coming up towards three months. I need to get this video out and done. So yeah, apologies, everyone. We're recording this before I put the Druids video out, by the way. Hopefully that will be done before the end of April, I said, like gritting my teeth. In addition to that, you can follow me on Twitter. I post stupid stuff on a regular basis that no human in their right mind would want to listen to, but you can find me there at, at the Histocrat, uh, the underscore Histocrat. And I also run a small Patreon, which I'm currently using to help fund the various technological improvements and kind of resources I have available for making my history videos. So you can check that out at patreon.com slash thehistocrat as well. And I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who has pledged in the past. And I'm very grateful and happy that all everything that I've done so far has had this level of support. It's, it's I mean, when I started this out, I famously think I said to you, Crofty, I'll be happy if this video gets 100 views. Yeah. And now look at you. Yeah, exactly. Mr. Mr. Big Shot over here. Yeah. <laughs> Who's about to be made unemployed. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so, Hey, I'll have more time to work on videos. Do you want to plug anything? Uh, nothing to plug at this stage. Yeah, so Crofty, you do some music stuff, but thanks to the prevailing circumstances, um, that's kind of off the table. So we'll give you an opportunity to do that as soon as life stops being a hellscape. Yeah, or once, or once I figure out how to set up a YouTube channel myself and actually have recordings I'm happy with. <laughs> Yeah, so well, hopefully that might happen sooner rather than later. Time on my hands, apparently, so... Yeah, nothing but time. It's what we all have, is just time. Mm. So. 
I don't know about you. I spent like an like five minutes just watching the next door neighbor's cat sitting on a box outside and just being like, "You." <laughs> Language just channels. like, uh, I know, and that's kind of like on the verge of what what I'm we're allowed to say here. Oh, can get I was like, look at him, look at him. He's just sat out there enjoying his sunshine. I remember the sunshine. <laughs> hey, since I've handed him a PhD, I've seen sunshine again. Yes, how was that? <laughs> sunshine or the PhD? Sunshine was horrible. <laughs> it burned. <laughs> We've witted on long enough then, so thank you guys. I'm going to call an immediate stop before we witter on for another two hours. Good plan. So thank you and good night. Goodbye.